Imagine a very young man from a ranching family in Cody, Wyoming, having just completed his sophomore year in high school, being selected by the preeminent Western sculptor of the day, Harry Jackson, whom we discussed in the first segment, to a two-year scholarship apprentice program. Under Jackson's care and supervision, the 16-year-old underwent an intensive study of both bronze sculpting methods and becoming a sculptor, providing him with the foundation to become the acknowledged master of realism in bronze. McGarry took color and detail to new levels and became the successor to Jackson's legacy. Perfecting his skills by working in foundries and learning the possibilities of bronze casting, McGarry's early work earned him a rare and life-changing opportunity. At 24 years old, he was invited to attend a Sundance ceremony at the Pine Ridge Reservation, rarely seen by outsiders. McGarry's intended to stay three days, and it lasted a whole summer. His instincts to show respect, to listen, and learn resulted in his staying with the tribal chief, Gerald Red Elk. McGarry was given a second name, reflecting his unquenchable desire to learn and listen to the stories of the past. They called him Big Red Ears. At his departure that summer, Gerald Red Elk gave the young sculptor words to live by, to observe, to listen, to share. That, that, that trip was probably the, the real, the real um, foundation of, of what I do today because it gave me respect for the Indian people that, that I really had, had no idea was there. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. And I was only gonna be up there for about two or three weeks. And after I got up there and, and got acquainted with the people, it just, I just didn't wanna leave. McGarry's work focused upon the lives of historic figures among the Plains Indians through meticulous research and numerous visits to Indian reservations, gathering stories and talking with relatives of his subjects. The walls of Dave's finishing studio in Riadosa, New Mexico, bear the motto, there are no limits. His finished works are cast in bronze and are composed of up to 150 individual pieces sourced from 10 highly specialized foundries throughout the country and then assembled in his finishing studio. Perhaps the biggest social event of the year in Houston, Texas is the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo held in the Houston Astrodome. In 1998, a 16-foot tall monumental statue by Dave was installed on the Astrodome grounds and I was asked by Dave to give the keynote address at the opening. The figure is a mini Kanju Sioux chief who fought at the Little Bighorn. The piece is entitled, Touch the Clouds, and he himself was well over six foot six tall. As I was told by an exuberant Texan, complete with cowboy hat, quote, we Texans like our cowboy monuments, but this is the first Indian anywhere in our city. He was kind of unsure whether this was a good idea or not. He went on to say, well, at least we don't want him armed. He is, in fact, not carrying any weapons. was a one-of-a-kind artist and when I say one-of-a-kind I truly mean there is no one and will never be another Dave McGarry who can create something so beautiful and is what is dedicated before us today. While McGarry was working at the Shadoni Foundry in Santa Fe he was casting bronze sculptors by day and sculpting his own figures in the evening. His earlier work reflected his studies with Harry Jackson. He was not yet using paint but was experimenting with subtle color differences created by different patinas. Entitled Sioux Pride, this work was casted a year after his experience living with the Sioux at Pine Ridge. 
and definitely reflects that experience. As Dave McGarry's work continued, he shattered many perceptions about the limitations of working in bronze. This is a pivotal piece in Dave McGarry's work. Technically, he was gradually moving towards using paint and several patinas to create color differences. Having witnessed many Indian ceremonies which were full of color, he felt this was largely missing among contemporary sculptors. Additionally, he had the experience with color working with Harry Jackson. Here we see Dave McGarry working on the clay model of the life-size image of Long Soldier, which is close to seven feet tall. This piece was sculpted in 1988. This Ogallala Sioux warrior, original name was Red Horn, but after defeating a lieutenant colonel in battle, he took his cavalry sword and jacket and proudly displayed these trophies as he rode through his camp and received his new name, Long Soldier. The image here is perhaps a few months after the event and shows the jacket being decorated to conform to its new owner's wishes. Of great significance to McGarry is meeting and becoming lifelong friends with Daniel Long Soldier, the great, great grandson of the Sioux warrior Long Soldier. The two traveled throughout many reservations, witnessed many ceremonial events, and heard the stories from living relatives of the figures Dave would soon immortalize in bronze. Dave would call Daniel his artery into the Indian world. Reflecting the importance McGarry felt about this piece, he created it in a larger than life size, roughly seven feet high. The central element to Dave McGarry's work is sculpting images of historically real figures that existed among the Indian tribes. However, Strikes with Thunder is not an identifiable warrior. Instead, his war shirt, made from a captured American flag, is a genuine piece Dave discovered in a private collection. Taking important symbols from an enemy was a common practice of the Teton Sioux during the latter 19th century. These items were usually modified or decorated to suit the new owner's wishes. The remainder of the figure's garb has been carefully constructed to represent what McGarry believes he is likely to have worn. Dave, in his work with Daniel Long Soldier, was building trust within the Native American community. Reflecting that trust, Strikes with Thunder was selected for the 1991 Native American Film Festival poster. This action piece, entitled Matter of Honor, depicts Crow King, chief of the Hunkpapa Sioux, who is likely the only chief to openly oppose Sitting Bull prior to the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. He distrusted Sitting Bull's advisors and medicine men and came to believe that adopting the white man's ways offered the only hope for Indian survival. Nevertheless, as a matter of honor, Crow King abided by the wishes of other tribes and fearlessly led his horsemen in the strategic turning point of the battle by cutting off Custer's 7th Cavalry from escaping to a nearby river, thus forcing them to make their stand on an exposed ridge. Crow King and his famous dappled gray horse are seen here moments after capturing the 1861 Light Cavalry Sword and the 7th Cavalry Officer's coat. The Battle of the Little Bighorn was the last significant victory of the Indian Wars for the Plains Indians. Seen here is a portrait of Crow King, painted in 1885. Throughout his life, Crow King continued to advocate peace with the whites. Now, just so you don't think that Dave McGarry only sculpted fierce warriors, he would occasionally explore more lighthearted but still Native American subjects. This small piece, entitled Lakota Hoofprints, exhibits a sense of whimsy, but is impeccably detailed and totally accurate. 
It's difficult to capture the summation of Dave McGarry's life, having passed away at 55 years old, yet accomplishing two full lifetimes of work. His focus on all aspects of Native American life and history was absolute, while executed with remarkable artistic skill and innovation. Simply put, there was, and still is, nobody like him. The ancient past of the first Americans continues to appear in contemporary images of the present. This is an extraordinary painting executed in 2002 with petroglyphs of the Anasazi in the background. Archaeologists and researchers have spent decades studying the country's most ancient Native American culture. It is monumentally complex with more questions than answers. What is accepted is it was centered throughout the four corners seen on this map where Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, and Arizona meet. The darkened areas are where the different communities live. Mesa Verde, Colorado, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, Canyon de Chez, Arizona. It's believed 30,000 Anasazis live on the floor region of Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. For as yet unknown reasons, this highly organized civilization, dating back to 1500 BC, abandoned their fertile and complex cities around 1250 to retreat to cliff dwellings seen here. Cliff Palace, Mesa Verde in Colorado, and White House ruins in Canyon de Chez in Arizona. It, it's kind of reassuring to know that someone else had White House ruins. It's unclear what drove these civilizations to migrate. Lack of food, drought, violence, war. Dave McGarry ventured into this ancient land with a series of sculptures attempting to capture what we know and what we can imagine about these very first Americans. This piece is entitled Carrier of the Sun, depicted here by Dave McGarry in this unique work entitled Muralist at Pottery Mound, reflects that great art, petroglyphs, and pottery have been found in these almost inaccessible kivas, sometimes upwards of 600 feet above the valley floor. Pottery Mound in New Mexico is an especially rich site which Dave has chosen to recreate. We're looking at an artist working around 1300 AD. Our primary focus of Western history really begins after European settlers began looking westward to extend the frontier. In the simplest of terms, the frontier is where the white population ends and faces the Native American lands. This illustrates where the frontier existed in 1775 with the original 13 colonies. The frontier definition is not static. It keeps moving westward, as represented in this early chromolithograph, depicting these early settlers moving into Native American lands a close look reveals two Indians on the far side of the river, gazing at the long line of unwanted intruders. The artists of the period were encouraged to paint images of promise, the expanding frontier offered to encourage settlers to settle into these new territories. The men who pushed that movement are represented by Harry Jackson's sculptor, the Pennsylvania Rifleman which roughly depicts about 1730. This is another figure drawn from Jackson's unfinished, massive mural that we discussed in the first segment. These images were intended to represent the period around the French and Indian Wars that lasted almost a decade between 1754 and 1763. 
Jackson is seen here working on the mural, with the frontiersman in the center of the photo. The most widely known figure from this era was Daniel Boone, born in 1734. Known as the Great Pathfinder, pictured here is an idealized image of Boone leading early settlers westward through the Cumberland Gap. This was a natural path through the Appalachian Mountains to settle Kentucky, then beyond the borders of the original colony. By the end of the 18th century, 200,000 people had followed Boone's path. Boone went on to fight in the Revolutionary War and was elected three times to the Virginia General Assembly. In 1784, a book was published on him and his exploits were captured in stories about his many battles with Native Americans and even being captured and escaping. Boone was known for his wit and pithy quotes. When asked if he ever got lost, he replied, well, I've never been lost, but I will admit to being mighty turned around for three days. Lamenting the tendency for exaggeration, Boone stated, many heroic actions and chivalrous adventures are related to me, which exist only in the regions of fancy. With me, the world has taken great liberties. Now for the myth part. Daniel Boone never wore a coonskin cap. He thought they were obnoxious. The Algonquin were one of the most populous Native American groups comprised of 60 linked tribes. The marked area here defines where they live. They were hunters, trappers, and fished the freshwater areas and cultivated corn, beans, and squash. They engaged in constant battles with the English settler while maintaining alliances with the French throughout all the wars between the British and the French. Seen here is a fully decked out warrior from one of the Algonquin tribes. This iconic painting, executed in 1770 by American-born Benjamin West, depicts the Battle of Quebec and the turning point in the French and Indian War. The British commander, General James Wolfe, was killed and West chose to depict the moment in an allegorical, almost Christ-like fashion. It propelled Wolfe into an iconic national hero and broke many artistic conventions of the day. After the defeat of the French, they sided with the British against the colonists under the belief if the British had won the Revolutionary War, they would stop westward expansion into their lands. The British lost. Ultimately, the Algonquins dwindled in numbers, frequently broken treaties, some retreated to Canada, and some settled on reservation land. This small polychrome bust by Harry Jackson is of an Algonquin chief, which also was depicted in Jackson's Fort Pitt mural. At times, Jackson's would cast the bust of a full-size sculpture, and this is the image of the Algonquin chief and accompanying warrior as it is portrayed in Jackson's mural. Here we see Texas Governor John Connolly, who was a serious collector of Harry Jackson's work, examining the Algonquin chief. The Iroquois Confederacy united five tribes, Mohawks, Onondaga, Cayuga, Oneida, and Seneca, with a sixth sometime later. At the arrival of the European, they were a sophisticated, thriving confederacy of 5,000 members. They were totally unique. They were the oldest living participatory democracy on earth. That's worth repeating. The oldest living participatory democracy on earth. After continuous war among the tribes, they agreed the cost was just too high, and they met and developed 
great law of peace, which formed an approach to governing unfamiliar to Europe and the colonies. In 1744, the Onondaga chief addressed representatives from the 13 colonies with a plea that they follow the Iroquois plan. This inspired Benjamin Franklin and other leaders. History has acknowledged the impact this had on the foundation of our democracy. Franklin invited the Iroquois Great Council to address the Continental Congress in 1776. The Iroquois used a simple but powerful metaphor. Many arrows cannot be broken as easily as one. This is reflected in the eagle seal clutching 13 arrows. As tensions between the British and the French in Canada worsened, the Iroquois relations with the French worsened as well. Pressure from both sides forced the Confederation to take sides, some with the French, some with the British. This piece depicts an Iroquois guide aligned with the British. We looked at a polychrome version of this Harry Jackson's work entitled Iroquois Guide. This is a standard patina version of the same piece. This is Harry Jackson working on that large mural intended for Fort Pitt. An image of the Iroquois Guide is on the wall behind him. Jackson intended the figure to be the guide for a young Lieutenant Colonel George Washington of the Virginia State Militia leading the first assault on a French fort of the French and Indian Wars. By the Revolutionary War, the Iroquois again split loyalties and by the war's end, both sides were ruined, their lands confiscated, and those siding with the colonists received no compensation for their loyalty. There was peace, but no victory for the Iroquois. The Lewis and Clark expedition is probably the best known story of the early exploration and expansion into the West. Departing from St. Louis in 1804, the expedition named the Corps of Discovery traveled through the territory of the recent Louisiana Purchase of 828,000 acres and beyond. It was all unfamiliar land the expedition was initiated by President Thomas Jefferson with three objectives, to explore the land before it could be settled, to establish trade with the Indian tribes, and to affirm U.S. sovereignty in the region. A hoped for goal was to discover the elusive Northwest Passage, a waterway connecting the East to the West Coast. They departed with 45 souls, including a boat crew and interpreter. They left and sailed up the Missouri River in a keel boat, the Pathfinder, and two smaller flat bottom vessels. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark led this remarkable journey. Lewis served as President Jefferson's personal secretary and was asked to lead the Corps. Clark had a military background. An equally important name is the 16-year-old Shoshone-born Sacagawea, who joined the group when they reached Mandan territory. Seen here with her child, who traveled with the expedition, she proved invaluable as a guide, a translator, and her presence avoided conflict with several tribes along the route. One critical encounter occurred when the expedition, low on supplies, faced crossing the Bitterroot Mountains and realized it was impossible without more horses. They encountered a hunting party and peacefully negotiated the needed supplies with Sacagawea using native sign language. Lewis's journal detailed 39 encounters with various tribes, 
Seen here in amazement, watching Captain Clark dress in full uniform demonstrate a unique weapon called an air rifle. It fired 22 rounds using compressed air instead of black powder and sufficiently impressed the onlookers, thus avoiding conflict. Another catastrophe was avoided when Sacagawea captured as a young age by the Lakota tribe, led the Corps to the Shoshone village where her brother was a chief. Their emotional reunion definitely saved lives on both sides. Approaching the Pacific coast, while on the lower Columbia River, they were approached by the Chinook people. This depicts Sacagawea standing in the midsection of the Corps' vessel with Lewis standing beside her as she uses native sign to assure the Chinook of peaceful intentions. On the morning of November 16, 1805, the party saw the Pacific Ocean, and Sacagawea is pictured here, running along the beach, moccasins in hand, full of joy at their success. The Corps moved a bit south, a short distance, and established their winter quarters and set about making salt for the winter months. Five iron buckets filled with seawater atop a salt cairn on fire round the clock could produce four gallons of salt a day. That moment of discovery is captured by the Oregon sculptor Stanley Wanless in his work entitled Arrival. This is a maquette, or smaller example, of a monument-sized piece located on the northern Oregon coast. The two explorers are represented with most likely an Indian now part of the Corps, while the discovery is being entered into their daily journals. A massive Newfoundland dog named Seaman was purchased by Lewis and became indispensable retrieving game from the water, chasing squirrels, which were considered good eating, and actually saving a few lives, including Lewis's on one occasion. Threatened by a buffalo charging through their camp, Seaman chased it away. He survived the trip. The return voyage was no less arduous. Lewis is seen here crossing the Clark Fork River near Missoula, Montana. The Corps of Discovery achieve the unimaginable 8,000 miles in two and a half years, avoided a serious conflict with all the native tribes. Only one death occurred, and that was sickness. No desertions, and back east, it was generally believed they had all perished. Two remarkable facts. There are more statues of Sacagawea throughout the United States than any other woman. And the loyalty of Seaman was such that when Lewis was buried in 1809, the dog would not leave the gravesite, refused to eat, and passed away. Although painted almost a half century after the Lewis and Clark expedition, this masterpiece by Emmanuel Lutz, the painter of the iconic Washington Crossing the Delaware, is entitled, Westward, the Course of the Empire Takes Its Way. It dramatizes the spirit of manifest destiny. And on the lower corners of the frame, Daniel Boone, who opened exploration to Kentucky, on the right side, and Meriwether Lewis opened the way for westward settlement on the left side. The lower portion is a panoramic view of their destination, Golden Gate in San Francisco Bay. This composition was commissioned for a 20 by 30 foot mural for the State Capitol building in Washington, seen here during a restoration of the work. George Catlin is the most important artist explorer of the early West, who has left an unmatched record of American Indian culture before, quote, being corrupted by westward expansion, end quote. 
In 1830, Catlin had a chance encounter with a delegation of Plains Indians. It changed his life's work. In his own words, quote, to snatch from hasty oblivion a truly lofty and noble race, end quote. For the next eight years, Catlin traveled from the Great Plains to the Rockies and from the Missouri River to the Mexican border. Painting images of Indian customs, like this massive game of lacrosse among the Choctaw warriors, he determined there were no rules and no boundaries, and it was vicious. He visited over a hundred tribes and produced 600 paintings. His portraits, like this image of White Cloud, a chief of the Iowas, have become prized for their accurate recording of specific figures in Native American history. This standing figure is Watchful Fox of the Sauk and Fox tribes. Catlin's genius was seeing the need to pursue his dream of painting all the Indian tribes. He became a crusader for Indian rights, a prolific writer and lecturer. He did not paint the stereotypical redskin. He captured each sitter's unique personality never romanticizing them. Here is a Mandan ceremony called Bull Dance, with eight figures in the center impersonating the buffalo and calling for a successful hunt the next day. Well, not all ceremonies were pain-free, as seen in this Mandan ritual, testing the warrior's bravery and ability to endure, let us just call it discomfort. Here is Little Wolf of the Iowa people in full war paint. Considered among his finest works is this remarkably sensitive image of Osceola of the Seminole tribe in Florida. Catlin often faced criticism from doubters back east. He tried desperately to get Congress to purchase and maintain the entire collection and never received approval. Perhaps a reflection of Catlin's premonition is this almost comical image depicting a highly respected Assiniboine chief who visited Washington, D.C. and returned in this dress only to be criticized and ostracized by his tribe. This is a drawing Catlin did of himself, painting perhaps the noblest, most gifted chief of the entire northern tribe. His name was Four Bears. Remember that name. We'll be coming back to it several times. On several occasions, he refused private offers to acquire the entire collection. Today, the largest exhibition of George Catlin's portraits is in the National Gallery of Fine Arts in Washington, D.C. Seen here, is a brilliant portrait of an Assiniboine chief by a young 23-year-old Swiss-born and trained artist. Less than two years after Catlin traveled the Missouri River, Carl Bodmer traveled the same route with the Prussian Prince Maximilian. The expedition was progressing through territories of still suspicious Indian tribes and were constantly being watched. It's well documented the young Bodmer brought with him from Europe a mechanical music box which intrigued the tribes he encountered. The noise was considered good medicine. The expedition traveled 5,000 miles in 1834 and 35. The prince, a trained naturalist and scientist, made notes about all he saw while Bodmer painted images along the way like these Sioux teepees with a scalp dance among the Minotauri Indians. Bodmer's skill in painting extraordinary details is seen in this image of an elaborately attired Minotauri chief. Bodmer also painted images of the expedition's travels. Here, the members are seen on their river vessel with an encampment of the Gros Ventre tribe on the far side of the river and several curious tribesmen approaching them. The Gros Ventre were Algonquin-speaking 
and found in northern Montana. Bodmer was relentless in seeking distinct practices among the many tribes he visited. One particular practice is represented in this piece, showing a scaffolding being constructed for burial purposes. Instead of burying their dead in the ground, they were carefully wrapped and placed high above the ground level until the remains were no longer there. Their travel had taken them to the farthest outpost of the American Fur Company, Fort Mackenzie, Montana, witnessing an attack on the fort by Cree and Assiniboine convinced the party to return to Fort Clark in friendlier Mandan territory. Here Bodmer painted many portraits, including forebears, painted a year earlier by Catlin. Bodmer was equally impressed with forebears. Like Catlin, Bodmer witnessed the incredibly dangerous buffalo hunts and the ceremonies asking for a successful hunt. At this time, Bodmer painted what many historians believe is the finest depiction of Indians of the Upper Missouri. This is a Hidasta Sioux performing the Dog Society dance. The headpiece is raven or magpie feathers, and around his neck is a slip of red cloth. He is engaged a loud and boisterous dance. The expedition stayed in the United States for only two years, and upon returning to Europe, produced a full-color portfolio, including the Dog Society dancer. After the initial excitement waned, the portfolio was stored in Germany and forgotten, where it remained for close to 100 years. It was discovered in the late 1940s and returned to America. Forebear's importance to painters and sculptors is evident to this day. This is an elaborate interpretation of the famous chief by one of the many talented contemporary artists today. Both George Catlin and Carl Bodmer painted Forebear. This version by Bodmer differs a bit. The sculptor John Coleman has studied both of these pioneering artists of the West and chose this as his inspiration for this version of Forebear. As Coleman has said, <laughs> life and ambition sometimes collide. It's called responsibility. He worked as a contractor while learning to sculpt in the evening. He began devoting full time to sculpting in 1994 at 45 years old. He hasn't looked back since. He's seen here in his Prescott, Arizona studio with a monument sized work behind him. Catlin's diaries described him as an extraordinary man, free, generous, elegant, gentle, manly, and brave. Approaching Catlin to pose for a painting, Catlin wrote, no tragedian ever trod upon a stage or gladiator enter the Roman Forum with more grace and manly dignity. Inspired by the Catlin painting, Dave McGarry presents forebears at a time when the Upper Missouri tribes had not yet had extensive exposure to the white traders and trade goods, as seen by the use of quill work instead of bead work in his tunic, leggings, and moccasins. Forebears was given his name after defeating an Assiniboine chief in battle and being described as fighting like four bears. As with many stories of the struggle to settle the West, this one has a tragic but not unfamiliar ending. Carl Bodmer was the last North American white man to see four bears alive. A group of French Canadian trapper aboard a riverboat approached the Mandan village with the body of a dead companion wrapped in a blanket. He had died of smallpox and was left ashore. The Mandans took the infected blanket. In 1837, the Mandan tribe was estimated at 1,600 in number. In three days, it was reduced to less than 150. 
forebears watched his wife and children die. And then he died shortly thereafter. But not before, on July 30th, addressing the sick but remaining Mandans. Ever since I can remember, I have loved the whites. I have lived with them. I have never wronged a white man. I never saw a white man hungry. I gave him to eat, drink, and a buffalo skin to sleep on in times of need. I was always ready to die for them. I have done everything a red skin could do for them. And how have they repaid me? With ingratitude. Today, I pronounce them to be a set of black-hearted dogs. They have deceived me. Them that I always considered as my brother has turned out to be my worst enemy. I am wounded by them, by those same white dogs that I have always considered and treated like brothers. His words were captured by a Canadian fur trapper who was present at the time of Forbear's death. The background to the events of the Alamo is significant political changes that occurred in Mexico, with Antonio Santa Anna becoming president in 1835. New policies were enacted that abolished slavery and other laws and tariffs that angered the residents of Mexican-owned Texas, who were largely immigrants from the U.S., and many of them slave owners. Unrest flared until war broke out in October and by December 1835, the Texicans had defeated the Mexican garrison stationed in Texas, including taking the sprawling three-acre complex, the Alamo. The acting Texican commander, Colonel James Neal, formally requested arms and men to defend the badly undermanned Alamo and was refused. However, Colonel James Bowie was dispatched with a modest 30 men. Later, Colonel William Travis arrived, followed by Davy Crockett in early February, 1836. Santa Ana had also passed a law which allowed him to declare residents of Texas that defied recent legislation as pirates. As such, he could kill all Texicans defying his rules and take no prisoners. Historians to this day are unsure if the defenders of the Alamo were aware of this. Santa Ana amassed about 6,000 troops to march to the Alamo. They encountered particularly severe conditions, Indian attacks, sickness, poor food, and rarely seen 16 inches of snow, continual skirmishes with the Texicans, also contributed to reducing his forces to only 2,000 troops. Delays and indecision resulted in no reinforcements in any meaningful numbers reached the Alamo, while the Mexican forces finally reached 3,100 prior to the final assault. A small group of 50 Texicans did break through the Mexican lines, entering the Alamo on March 4th. On March 5th, the siege started, with the Alamo defenders basically unprepared, and Mexican troops, under a dark moonless night, getting to within musket range of the fort before being detected. Three separate waves of attacks occurred before the walls were breached. Colonel Travis was among the earliest killed. Bowie had previously fallen ill and was bedridden, and likely killed in his cot back against the wall, firing his pistols at the entering soldier. Two versions of Crockett's death have emerged. He surrendered and was later bayoneted, and he was found dead with 16 dead Mexican troops surrounding his body. Casualty estimates vary widely. 
But what is accepted is 400 to 600 Mexican troops were killed and 182 to 257 Texican defenders. The battle was over by 6.30 a.m. All the bodies were bayoneted and stacked and burned. Strangely, three simple coffins were marked, Travis, Crockett, and Bowie, and filled with the ashes of those burned. On March 2nd, while all this was unfolding, Texas declared itself independent forming the Republic of Texas. On April 21st, despite Santa Ana's overwhelming superiority in troops and numbers, was attacked by the Texas Army and defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto, effectively ending Mexico's control of Texas. The story of the Alamo, the most popular tourist attraction in Texas, has been told in four feature-length films the first in 1911, scores of books and 11 ballads performed by artists like Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Marty Robbins, and others. The Alamo quickly became a national symbol or rallying cause that reinforced the doctrine of manifest destiny and the country's right to own Texas and California. January 24th, 1848, began what historians describe as the most significant event during the first half of the 19th century, the California Gold Rush. John Sutter was having a sawmill built on his property along the American River, roughly 50 miles east of Sacramento. His carpenter, James Marshall, discovered gold. The two agreed to be partners, but could not keep their find a secret, and news spread fast. Stories and advertisement like this fueled a lust for riches. As the soon-to-be-known 49ers began their desperate journey across the country, they faced a harsh and unforgiving terrain, which took its toll in people and livestock. Many didn't make it. The favored route was the Oregon Trail. Undaunted, they kept coming. It is believed over the roughly two years of active mining, 10,000 wagon trains left the East Coast, heading west. If the distance, weather, and terrain weren't enough, the threat of Indian tax was very real. On some occasions, they were able to escape as seen here, but on many others, the fate was much worse, as the local Indian tribes desperately fought to protect what they believed was their land. Many of the 49ers were city folk who had never camped outdoors, hunted for food, or even built a fire. The Oregon Trail passed through a narrow stretch between lava rocks, known as Massacre Rocks, in present-day Idaho. It was a good place for an Indian ambush. The trip was so grueling on the oxen or mules pulling the Conestoga wagons, they were often forced to discard the cherished items intended for their new homes in order to lighten the load. Here, the Sioux warrior gazes at his reflection in the mirror, probably wondering, who are these strange people who need all this useless stuff. The California Gold Rush triggered the largest mass migration of people in American history. Prior to 1884, California had 150,000 Native Americans and roughly 1,000 non-Native peoples. By 1850, more than 300,000 new arrivals flooded the tiny San Francisco village of 200 people. About one in 10 Americans were living in California and the explosion of people accelerated California achieving statehood by 1850. Roughly half the gold seekers came overland from the East Coast and half by sea from Latin America, China, Australia, and even Hawaii. 
found among the miners were Filipinos, Turks, and Basques. It was lawless, violent, and ruled by vigilante attacks, especially against Native Americans. They were systematically being forced off their historical land to make room for the miners. It is estimated that one in 12 miners died, often of disease. When not working the gold fields, miners' behavior varied, as seen here. Some resting and discussing events of the field, others enjoying a rip-roaring drunk. To the right, you can see one actually washing his clothes and hanging them on to dry. Very rarely did the gold seekers bring their women with them. This is a rare case where this in fact happened. It took a very brave woman to accompany her man on such a venture. Well, in the absence of uh, free ladies, nighttime entertainment became raucous, loud, and often out of control. If you were lucky enough to find a shiny little nugget, there were places to go and spend it. As quickly as miners arrived, so did very active brothels. It was a business that thrived even in the most turbulent of times. It is estimated that roughly $2 billion worth of gold was found. Only a small percent of miners got rich. However, the merchants who emerged to supply needed goods did get rich, with prices like $25 for one egg and a pair of boots, $2,500 in today's money. Many famous entrepreneurs got their start in the gold fields. Levi Strauss, Henry Wells and his partner, William Fargo, to name two. In a few short years, the gold fever died down. And by 1850, all of John Sutter's property was overrun by miners, his belongings stolen, and he declared bankruptcy. The appeal of striking it rich provides the narrative and drama for film, literature, and art. The saga of the 49ers certainly provided the subject for scores of artists to depict, as seen in this ambitious example. The artist and illustrator, Dean Cornwell, was a major force behind the first half of the 20th century, often called the Golden Age of Illustration. He was commissioned to paint a depiction of the 49ers on the centennial celebration of the event. Cornwell was meticulous in his process and completed numerous detailed studies prior to the finished piece. Here is the finished piece and it makes for an interesting side-by-side -side comparison. Noticing the similarities and the changes Dean Cornwell made from final study to finished painting. It seems appropriate to close our second segment on a happy note. And what could be happier than discovering gold? Golden are the suburbs of the Oscars of town. These are the places so friends push me down. Nothing but the dark stars shining on me. Loneliness seems to be my destiny. Listen to the old man. He speaks like thousands of seashells. Forever he's helpless. In those chaos, of course, and bittersweet lyrics.